Hello Tim, it's nice to meet you uh, on the beautiful banks of the River Wye. I think the weather could be a little bit warmer and nicer than it is, but we can't have everything. Now, I've already been introduced to you on this trip, but for those people that are watching that may not have heard of you before, can you just introduce yourself, who you are and, and, and what your background is in the angling world? Well, uh, yeah, obviously, Tim Hodges. Uh, Self-addicted fisherman, not just a carp angler, I love fishing just love fishing always have done since i was five when my granddad took me fishing uh my formative years were spent in advertising and i met people like martin Locke and was doing adverts for him uh del kim's first adverts just because i worked in advertising so i knew how to put things together uh but in early and in fact 1990 i decided to get out of advertising and go berserk and launch my own fishing magazine carp fishing magazine at the time uh much to the my wife's horror <laughs> because she felt it was a bit rash but it was something i'd thought about for years and decided i could give it a go uh did that on my own for a couple of years but then was bought out by david hall publishing who also had various other fishing publications at the time uh, and I became editor of the relaunch of my magazine uh, which was called Carp News and Angling Techniques uh, which became Catch More Carp which later morphed into Total Carp. Uh, I worked on various publications for David uh, and ended up as the editor of Advanced Carp Fishing uh, but over the sort of years, I've sort of, apart from being the editor, I've run fisheries in the UK or managed fisheries in the UK and in France. Uh, I've worked in the trade as a consultant to various fishing companies. Uh, and I just love fishing, all types of fishing, but obviously carp fishing in the UK, they're mostly the biggest fish and uh, the most I suppose romantic I don't know if romantic is the right word but just became addicted to carp fishing probably from the 70s from the age of 14 uh, that was mostly in the Darrant Valley uh, progressed on to the Colne Valley fishing the big waters like Harefield, Save, the Cons, Wiltonians uh, but then discovered France and that was almost sort of like a, a downfall to my English fishing because France opened up a whole avenue of a bigger fish uh, and no people, which was fantastic. Uh, and I've just sort of been in and out of doing various things. Uh, obviously, a lot of people know that I'm involved with Palatrax, but mostly a, I like the products, but B, I quite like Simon Pomeroy. And we, we're more mates than anything else. I'm not paid by Palatrax. I literally offer my advice for what it's worth on some things, especially bait. Uh, but I think you, all anglers, you, you sort of end up using a company's products for whatever reason. But I, I, I like a lot of the products that Simon Pomeroy has developed through Palatrax. I like his bait. We've got a fantastic range of hooks, the grips hooks, which are quite unique. Obviously the stones, which might be probably the most controversial product because some people will love them like I do and some people still want to use lead weights. Uh, we've got Gamma Line. So there's... There's a lot of nice products that I like using. So, yeah, I'm just an addictive fisherman. It's, this is my crack cocaine. I love it. So, Well, I think we'll, we'll touch upon some of those points. You've glazed over a bit there, moving on. But as you just stated, you've been in the angler world for many decades. And your ties with Palatrex or your, your journey with Palatrex started some 20 years ago. So how did that come about? Well, at the time, I was working for a trade magazine called Tackle and Guns which a lot of obviously the general public don't know about it, but it's a magazine for the trade. Uh, and as part of my job was to try and 
uh, introduce myself to companies and see if I could help them grow th their business through our various publications at David Hall Publishing. And I, uh, I can't remember how I came across Palatrax because he wasn't a, a well-known brand. Uh, but I made a phone call and spoke to Simon and he happened to mention that he had some fishing lakes and if I was coming down to talk, why don't I bring my rods down and I could do a couple of nights fishing while we talk business. So I thought, well, that's a golden opportunity. Good excuse to get out of the office as well. So at the time he was over Dorchester way, uh, had a, some lakes called Paddington Lakes. And I went down and apart from talking business, when we sat down to do a bit of fishing and Simon started explaining at the time about the stones. And it, it, was, it was almost like a, I thought, why have I not thought of this? Because I've always tried to be innovative in my fishing and always tried to think more, you know, if, if I catch one carp, why can't I catch two? Why can't I catch four? So I was always trying to improve. And I thought, we're, we're in a situation where I'm using leads, which I'm camouflaging to try and hide them. And I could use a stone, which I don't have to camouflage. And it, it seemed to me to be quite an obvious thing to do. Uh, you've obviously got a few critics there, you can't cast them. Well, that's not strictly true. Yes, you can't cast a stone a million miles like you can a four ounce distance lead. I can still, I've cast a stone and measured 135 yards. So you can still blast them out a reasonable distance. And if you pick a nice round one, they're accurate. So, but the most, the thing I liked most about them was the fact that why would a fish be scared of a stone? It's just a stone. You know, it's the fish are used to finding stones. And even though I've had people once say, well, I fish a silty lake. And I said, well, silt technically is just uncompressed stone. So it, if you look at a stone as a natural product, there's no reason if a fish touches a stone for it to have any fear of it. Whereas they might be scared of lead because A, it's toxic, it's not natural. People talk about electrical fields that things may or may not give off. I don't know about that, I'm not a scientist, but I can vouch that I've never seen a car pick a lead up, but I've seen them pick stones up. And so it seemed like a no brainer to me. Uh, and then our journey carried on. And at the time he had a, a pattern of hook, uh, which was called the hook. A barbless, which I've always been a big fan of barbless hooks. I mean, I could go into detail about why, but at the moment, and I thought, well, I quite like these. They were strong and sharp. Uh, and we just sort of began our journey. I was also interested in the fact that he was very much into bait and quality bait. And I've been making bait since the 70s when I first discovered that, or Fred Wilton discovered, you know, boily mixes. And I really got into it. And I always wanted to develop the next big thing. And I've almost thought that it's like the Holy Grail trying to find the, the magic, you know, bait that the fish can't res resist. And I've been searching for it since the 70s. It, it doesn't really exist. But maybe one day I'll come up with a mix or, a, you know, an ingredient that the fish find irresistible. And I'll just keep, keep doing it, keep playing around with bait. I've been working this last week with Simon, just talking about ingredients, the way that the fish eat, the nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. I find it intriguing. So uh, yeah, uh, me and Simon have got a lot of perhaps ideas that are very similar. We don't always agree, but we, we try and sing off the same hymn sheet. So yeah, good good little journey really, I've enjoyed it. So you mentioned there that you're a big fan of barbless hooks. So what made you change from using barbless to the grips range? 
what did you think was made that an improvement over a more traditional barbless and out of the range what's your go-to one well firstly i i've always been a fan of barbless right because i did some tests i i i, I ain't all about fishing enough to want to do tests you know to make why things work the physics and i tested how much you need to pull on a hook to make a barbed hook enter a piece. I was using pork rind at the time uh, compared to barbless. And on average, even a micro barbed hook takes at least 25% more pressure to pull it past the barb. Because let's face it, until a hook is into the bend, it's not really in properly. So I was actually once fishing uh, with uh, Danny Fairbrass and he was, we were fishing a lake in Milton Keynes and he bumped three or four fish on the trot and I was landing fish and he couldn't understand why he was bumping them. And when we landed the next fish, we realised that the fish mouths were so hard because they were gravel feeders predominantly that I don't think his hook, because he was just picking the rod up, starting to play them and, and the hook just wasn't penetrating so I've always liked barbless for that reason it penetrates quicker and easier and then a while back Simon showed me this new range of hooks the grips and it you've got a bit of both so you've got barbless because there isn't technically a barb you've got these little serrated edges on the inside of the point which appear I don't know the science and it's hard to prove anything or disprove it, but they appear to help hold the hook in position. But without, when you, as soon as you release the pressure, the hook comes out very easily. So there's a lot of technical stuff there that is very difficult to explain to anyone. But also the point on these hooks where you've got the cutting point is exceptionally sharp exceptionally strong i found that they didn't blunt easily because there is a lot of hooks on the market now that are very very sharp but blunt you know almost single they're single use hooks and i suppose i'm one of those people that goes i don't want to keep retying rigs and messing about i want a hook that stays sharp i'm i'm not a fan of sharpening hooks because i think quite a lot of the time you're damaging a hook more than you're actually sharpening it properly because unless you've got a microscope or a big magnifying glass you, you can't really see what you're doing my eyes aren't good enough maybe young people have got better eyesight than me but going back to a pattern I really like the wide gapes because I'm a big fan that they've got a slightly beaked point and you've got a wide gape obviously because that's what it's called but if you look in nature every single animal or creature in nature that has to catch something to eat has got curved claws or curved talons they don't have straight ones straight ones are good for stabby but for catching anyone who's got a cat knows if they claw goes into your trousers or your jumper they're a bugger to get off so obviously from that point of view it seems to make sense to me i'm not a big believer in that fish hook themselves on ejection so i'm not worried about you know a hook hooking the fish on ejection i believe that they hook when they themselves when they move off and your hook link tightens to your weight and the hook turns and grips so from that point of view uh wide gapes make a lot of sense and if you actually look at the the eye on a wide gape hook it's slightly interned so when you tie a piece of line to a hook and pull on the eye the actual curved point is pointing at the eye so when as you pull it it makes that hook point turn towards the eye so you're actually pulling in a direct line which is similar to the curved shank if you look at a curved shank hook the eye is in line with the point so when you pull it, you're pulling on a level plane to the point, so making penetration easier. Uh, 
if you look at a normal u-shaped hook and pull on the eye the actual hook point tilts and again i've done these tests so i want to be pulling along the plane i don't want to hook sort of skidding along the flesh so wide gate fits most of my fishing regardless of whether it's a chod a zig rig or whatever i can use a little bit of shrink tubing if i want to change angles but they're great hooks caught me a lot of fish well moving on from the hooks you did mention that you've been behind the scenes with pallet hooks for a long time and, and quite a lot in the bait world why do you think the bait is, is doing so well and has been so consistent for a long time see I, as i said i've been making bait since the 70s because i remember as a young lad seeing fred wilton and bob morris who developed the first original boy league and we were young kids, we were like 15, and we kept seeing these two guys, they were catching loads of carp, and they were using these big, big, big round balls, and we, we just didn't know what they were. And it took ages to find out, and gradually the secret came out that they'd invented the boilie. And Fred Wilton's whole concept was, it was a complete meal in a bait, which was reasonably new theory, and also because he only wanted to catch carp instead of using paste baits which we'd all been using and getting pestered with bream tench roach and whatever whittling your paste away he put a light skin around the outside so it became a boil it became a very selective bait now over the years so we all started playing around now i know that i was doing things with bait i didn't have a clue because i was a kid and I didn't know anything about fish nutrition. All I knew was you had to try and make a nutritional, high nutritional bait, HNV, high nutritional value. I didn't really know what I was doing other than you needed to try and find ingredients. I didn't know if they were good for the carp, they were bad for the carp. We didn't have the internet back then. So the research was difficult. I didn't want to go to the library and read books. That was for nerds, but we played around and every time you made a good bait and I can remember things like, you know, grinding up fish pellets because they obviously uh, made sense if they were being fed to fish. Uh, and I'd like a pound for every mix I've made and thrown in the bin because it wouldn't roll, it wouldn't do anything. Some, I, I remember when I first found shrimp meal and I thought everyone was raving about shrimp meal and I managed to find some put it into a mix, made like two kilos of baits of fish, turned up at the weekend, started catapulting them out, and they were all pop-ups because I'd put too much shrimp meal in the mix. I didn't know that you could only add about 10, maybe 15%. It's the same with krill now. The modern version of shrimp meal is krill powder. And if you put too much in, you make a load of pop-ups because it's a very light, airy mix. Very good ingredient. But... As I've progressed and got older and wiser, like, and we've got the internet, to me, producing a food for the fish, so it's not a lure, it's food that's good for them. So you, you had to do a bit of research on fish nutrition. And that's where the internet comes in. It's a wonderful thing. And I always worked on the theory that if I could find something that the fish recognized as good food, that they would come back for it. So I always say that your base mix is so important because if that's good food, your flavor is just really a, a label to attract the fish to it. Yes, some flavors seem to work better than others, but you can put a good flavor on a bad mix and they'll stop eating it because it's not good food. But a good flavor on a, a very good base mix, the fish recognize instinctively they haven't read the advert because everyone says their bait's great whole world and his wife say they've got great bait but the fish let you know and i've without doubt made some poor baits but i've also made some good ones that were consistent fish catchers and all you sometimes had to do was change tweak the flavors you know sometimes flavor level you know but flavors and that base mix would continue to catch because the fish recognized it as food. And, and they only do that according to the Japanese, 
who I worked with for a while, it takes them somewhere in the region of 24 to 36 hours to know whether something they've eaten is actually any good for them. Because if it's, if it's no good, they'll stop eating it. And they've proved this in tank tests. So as long as the fish are getting what they need from a bait, they'll keep coming back to it. So it is important to give them something that's really good because you can consistently catch more fish. Now, you do, I see a lot of people talking about, oh, this bait is all year, 365 year day of bait, you know, it works all the time, which isn't untrue, but fish definitely balance their diet to what they need. So at certain times of the year, they need more protein and other times they're looking for energy, so carbohydrate type baits. So if you're using a bait that's perhaps low or high in something, they might at certain times of year go off it because they're looking for something else. So it's a very complicated subject. Most people will never even consider trying to put a bait together from scratch, all the different ingredients. But I love it. It's always intrigued me. As I said, it's like the holy grail, trying to find something the fish find irresistible. I mean, I, I've always kept fish in tanks and test it. And I even used to catch them to make them scared of things because most fish in tanks will eat everything you throw in. But you can actually teach them. I remember I had some carp in the tank and as a kid, I had a little quiver tip and a bit of line on it. And I, I put a maggot on and you catch them all. After a couple of days, they wouldn't eat a maggot because they were terrified and went through all the baits. And they, they learn ever so quickly. People are not really aware of how quickly carp will learn that something's dangerous if they keep getting a hook in their lip and dragged out of the water. But the one thing that they never seemed to be able to resist was a thing called tube effects worms, which you can't even put on the hook. You literally, they're tiny, like almost like 15 pound line thick hook little worms, tiny little things. And uh, you used to have to drag your hook through them and drop them in, but they could never resist those. But I could never find a way of making a bait because when you made it into a paste, it wasn't the same. And it, it's frustrating when you think, well, I found something that's irresistible, but it's, it's just not the same when you make it into a paste and make it into a boil. It completely changes everything. Again, there's probably science behind that that I don't understand. But it, it's just an intriguing subject for me. But quality has always been my watchword. Even the pop-ups, I mean, going back to probably the 2000s, uh, I was managing a shop and I had my own range of pop-ups called Horrible Hummers. And the only difference between those and most commercially made pop-ups was I'd included a, a food content because most pop-ups that you buy commercially got no food content. They're just nice looking, smelling, bright lures. I included food content included taste and that was what was important to me because I, I didn't want them to suck it in and blow it out because it's not food I want them to suck it in at least taste it long enough for me to hook them but it's a complicated process if you look at the ingredients that I was using it's, it gets mind-blowing and expensive you can't make a good bait cheap it's impossible I mean People have stopped using raw eggs. Raw eggs are a fantastic ingredient, full of protein. Everything eats eggs. There's hardly an animal on the planet that doesn't eat egg if it's given a chance. And if you swap out what I call whole egg for dried egg, it's not the same. You make scrambled egg from powdered egg, you tell me if you can't tell the difference. It's instantly you can tell the difference. And for whatever reason, I would only ever use whole egg and where I can free range eggs because they taste nicer. To me, they taste nicer. So maybe it makes a difference for the carb. I don't know. But try and use free range eggs. Uh, I know some baits now commercially are made without egg at all. They're using other ingredients. 
and they're just not as good. I don't care what anyone says. I've, I had through the magazines, I used to be sent all sorts of bait to try and everything. And I used to, a lot of the time, because I didn't want to use them, I'd give them to my two lads who were fishing all the time. And they'd say, Dad, that bait's rubbish. I can't catch anything on it. And it, I can't stress enough how important good ingredients are. And luckily, Simon was of a light mind. Quality makes a difference. And when you look at some of the baits in the Palatrax range, especially recently, the multi-worm, which has no synthetic flavouring, it is just full of, as it is the description says, multi-worm. You've got silk worms, you've got uh, meal worms, you've got earthworms, and these are all ground up and added as the, the protein level and the taste. I mean, silkworm in particular, the Japanese rate silkworm highly for fish. I mean, a lot of the Japanese give them as treats to the koi carp and things, and they've got a very distinct aroma. And that uh, multi-worm bait has caught so many fish, yet people smell it and go, this doesn't smell it much, because they're used to baits being really smelly. Get them out of the pack and go, oh, oh, yeah, that smells nice. Well, does that mean anything? If you get a shrimp or a mussel out the bottom of the lake, it doesn't smell nice, it, but it's food. And fish recognise it as food. So, yeah, I, I like what Simon's doing. So I catch fish using his baits. Caught a lot of big fish. And uh, why would I... If I couldn't use Simon's bait, I'd have to make my own and I get... These days I'm getting a bit too long in the tooth to sit there for hours rolling baits. I find it very tedious. But, uh, yeah, it's it's quality quality over anything else. Now along with bait and hooks, of course you need a decent line to get fish into your landing net. Now I understand you're quite an integral part of the exclusivity of distributing the gamma line. How does that come about and, and is it as good as it, it's made out to be? Well again, if we go back to my time on the magazines, we obviously get, and you, you know this, you get lots of products sent to you to review and test. And I've been sent uh, probably hundreds of spools of line. Now, but I also know that line is manufactured by a small handful of companies worldwide. So most of the lines on the market come from one of these handful of suppliers because it's quite a complicated process to make reasonably good fishing line. And you, you look at these lines, and everyone, of course, says this line's the best line. It does this, it does that, and that. But I know that they're basically very similar. Might be a different colour, you know, and they may have added something or other, but they're, they're much of a nut. Just, if you look at the molecular, oh, we're going to get a bit of science now. If you look at the molecular structure of line uh, under a microscope, it looks like a, an elongated ladder. So you have lots of down lines with a few sort of like stretched out cross hatches. Now, when you take gamma, now we, or Simon first discovered this gamma line, and I was lucky enough to go to America with him when we was doing a big show over there to meet the guys from gamma. And they explained how it came about. And it came about through tennis string manufacture, which is made exactly the same way as nylon copolymer fishing line. But the tennis players, when the rackets got bigger, you know, all carbon fiber and they wanted them strung really tight and they were hitting the ball harder and faster. But some of them were moaning that because these strings had to be stretched so much, they had to use quite thick string. And then they started moaning that it was too slow through the air. And you think, oh, come on. How can that really fit? But it does, obviously, to a professional, it makes a bit of difference if they can just swing it faster. And some scientific genius said, well, you do realise that if we expose this copolymer or polymer to gamma rays, you can change the molecular structure and turn it from these elongated ladder-looking strings 
to almost like a, a landing net type look. So you increase the, the cells, the molecular cells, and therefore you make it stronger and more resistant to damage. So you suddenly can make it thinner for the same amount of breaking strain. And that improved tennis, I mean, we're talking about a company that's selling probably billions of dollars worth of tennis string, you know, it's far bigger than the fishing industry. And someone then said, well, you do realize that this is the same stuff that anglers use. So they experimented and realized that they could take any copolymer line manufactured, doesn't matter who by, expose it to gamma rays. This is a simplified obvious version. And you improve its strength and resistance, its abrasion resistance, impact resistance. Everything about it's improved. So you end up with technically a line that's thinner and stronger, which then enables the angler, if you take the average 15 pound uh, copolymer line sold, it's probably around 0 0.40 millimeters, give or take. The equivalent in gamma is probably 3.33. For, and it will be of a 23 pound breaking strain. So it's ridiculously stronger. And it, it makes perfect sense to be able to use a stronger line that's still thinner than 15 pound line. Especially if you're fishing for big fish and you need to cast. It, obviously you can use thinner line, cast it's stronger, cast a long way. I can remember fishing in the Cole Valley and to get sort of 160 plus, we were using six pound line as a main line and using shock leaders. Six pound line does, it's not particularly fish friendly, you know, and used to get cut offs a lot. So I'd love to have had gamma back in the eighties when I was fishing in the Cole Valley and used, you know, line that could cast a long way and be stronger. But technically that's what it boils down to. I mean, I was lucky to be involved with Simon and we've tested this line and I've used it because I fish a lot. You know, I don't just fish the odd weekend. I mean, I am obsessed with fishing and I've caught fish from sea fish when I go bass and wrasse fishing, you know, and I do all types of fishing, pike fishing, carp fishing. And there's times when I've got snagged up and you're pulling for a break and you think, this bloody line won't break. It is incredible stuff. So it's a no-brainer for me. I need a good line, and it's the best line I've ever tried. And I don't care, you know, the doubters, whatever. They can say what they like. It's the line on my reels. It's because it's the best line I've ever used. End of story. Well, Tim, it's very clear that you're a very active member of Team Palatrex, but what's your take on, on its growing initiative, and is it really worth other anglers joining up? Well, there's this group now called Team Palatrax. And what seems to be missing, when I first started my carp magazine, I wanted to educate, you know, people into fishing because I see so many people that just go fishing and they've not really been taught properly and they sometimes they're not catching fish because they're getting the basics wrong. And it's very difficult you know, because to meet enough people. Now, through this Team Palatrax, which, by the way, is free to join, there's no joining fee, so it doesn't cost you anything. It does open the avenue for discounted products. Yes, it's Palatrax products, but if you're going to get your bait and hooks with a, a slight discount, well, you know, you can't odds that. But the most important aspect of the team is it's a community where people can, through Facebook, they can ask questions without feeling like they're being stupid. Because I, 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 for years I've done talks at carp shows and various meetings. And when you say, has anyone got any questions? No one wants to put their hand up in case they, they think it's going to sound stupid. But there's no such thing as a stupid question. If you don't know what a hair rig is or a boilie or whatever, then 
it's not a stupid question just because everyone else might know and simon has always tried to say to people look just ask the questions because there's all these team members who can throw their tuppence worth in and there may be some conflicting ideas but that doesn't matter because you know as i say i'm an obsessive angler but i listen to other anglers because they might just have an idea that will make my fishing better so just because they've only been fishing for 10 minutes but they may have thought of something outside the normal box because i think we can be a bit guilty sometimes of going down avenues because this is the way to carp fish or this is the way to pike fish you know all the various forms when sometimes just thinking outside the box can improve your fishing but it, it's a nice community and we we desperately try to make sure that if anyone's getting a bit uh controversial from the point of view of slagging people off which is a bit the, probably the wrong way to say this but we don't want that in the team we want people to be constructive we want to help people uh, through the team we do a lot of fish-ins where people come along they book onto these fish-ins and they're there to people are there to try and help so there'll always be palatrax team members there who are there to perhaps try and help people who are less experienced you know some people try and say they've only been fishing a year you know what have you learned in a year in fishing i've been fishing for 61 years now you know and every time i go fishing i might learn something new do you know I, I, you, no one knows it all that's nonsense if you think you know it all and half the time the fish mug you off it's like we're barbel fishing uh, the last couple of days. We can't catch a barbel. I don't know what they're doing. We've tried everything, you know, and we're trying all sorts of different tactics, different baits. And sometimes the fish just are not playing for whatever reason. Caught plenty of chub. But the team spirit there is good. As I say, I, I've, I've met some of the team members uh, last week. They came for a fishing down at Ashman's Worthy Pools. And there was one guy, a complete novice, and he learned so much from, you know, because we explained, you know, about rigs, we explained about bait. Exactly. And I meet a lot of people whose casting is abysmal because they've never been taught how to cast. And if you've never been taught properly, why would you be any good at it? There's a lot of things that can go wrong with casting because casting is like a sport. There's a lot of physical aspects to casting and if you're not holding the rod right or standing right or making your arm do the right thing you're not going to do it properly but with a little bit of tuition as i usually tell people that you 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 need to have a little bit of tuition especially with casting and i usually say to people give me 15 20 minutes of your time and i will definitely improve your casting it might not turn you into a long range fishing because I often say to people, what's long range fishing? It's usually 10 yards further than you can cast. So if you can cast 50 yards, it's 60. If you can cast 150 yards, it's 160. But technique, you know, and there's a lot of technique in casting. But accuracy has got to be the most important one. It's no good if you can, it's all very well be able to cast a million miles, but if you're if it's going all over the place it's irrelevant but i like to think that if you can cast accurately 40 to 100 yards you're going to catch more fish because you're going to put your bait where you want it to be i see so many people just cast down and wherever it lands that'll do is that good enough i mean i'm a bit obsessive some people go fishing just to get away from the wife and kids and work and they just chill out so really they're chucking it out and if they catch a fish it's a bonus if that rocks their boat great but the, the going back to the team thing it's all about just people being in a nice community where they don't feel scared to ask a stupid question because it's not a stupid question so yeah it's good it's a nice nice little environment for people and it's free free to join no brainer
So going back in time a little bit to when you were the editor of a uh, Clout Fishing magazine, did you find there was any kind of difficulties with getting Palatrex involved in the magazine next to other more mainstream brands as well? Remarkably, yes. I, I never really understood why, other than, I mean, even, I mean, when I first met Simon, we were talking about advertising within all the publications that David Hall did at the time. So he had Advanced Carp, so if we talk about Carp magazine, we had Advanced Carp and Total Carp. And obviously the spend, advertising spend is power within publishing because you don't make money from sales. They cover some costs, but you make money from advertising revenue. And that's just the way it is. Right, so it, most magazines work along those lines. So, of course, there's lots of big brands and their spend was quite high. But at the time, Simon was prepared to spend quite a bit of money. And the deal was that he would get exposure in the magazines. And as I say, I wasn't editor of a carp magazine at that point. I was working on tackling guns. And... I don't know why, but the editors just found it difficult, for whatever reason, to get totally behind the Palatrax brand. And it, it caused a few issues for me because I'd sold a deal and trying to get the editors to uphold that deal where we were getting you know, exposure for the brand. Uh, I think it's known as being, you know, Simon's brand was a, a, almost like a disruptor because it was saying different things, you know, whereas some brands were saying, this is the way to do it. You know, and Simon was sort of saying, well, no, there is another way of doing it. So, yeah, it was, it was a bit weird. Uh, when I eventually uh, became editor of Advance Carp, uh, it gave me, as the editor, an opportunity to help promote Palatrax. And it, it, it's surprising how there was just problems with other companies that, you know, didn't want us promoting things that didn't sort of fall in line with their businesses. It, it was just weird. And I've never really understood why, but yeah, but the difference is that when you look back, say 20 odd years, I've seen a lot of companies come and go. Companies that looked like made sense, you know, had good little niche products, bits and pieces, but they've all disappeared because they just couldn't quite crack that, what, it's almost like the cartel of the big ones. You know, I mean, you go into a, any tackle shop now and look at the big brands. You know, they've got massive wall space. You know, and then anyone coming into the the market has this little space, and it's difficult for them to compete. And it is very difficult to stay going. But Palatrax has. It's still there because a lot of the products, like the stones, they do make sense. I mean, if you're going to be ecological, you know, about how green the product is, and it's won awards for that, it makes sense if you're going to say, well, yeah, I want to look after the environment. Stone makes sense. Can't argue against lead. Lead's toxic. It is toxic. It doesn't matter what we say. I always say to people, you wouldn't give your child a glass of water that a lead weight had been sat in for 24 hours. You just wouldn't do it. Whereas a stone... It's just a stone. You could eat a stone. The worst, it'll you'll, it'll come out the other end. But lead, you wouldn't want that going through your system. So yeah, it's it's a good product. Makes sense. We've got good hooks, good line. You know, and bait. We, we've already talked about, and the stones they stand alone as a uh, an obvious product to use. And Simon and Palatrax are still here and it appears getting stronger. Well, that leads me on to my next question is that you've just stated that it clearly was a bit of a struggle in the earlier days to get people on board with the Palatrax idea and ethos. 
but it seems to be getting much more positive recognition now. Even from our videos, you're seeing there's people getting more on board with it, the, the team's page is growing, people using more of the products. Do you think that is the, the green route you just talked about, that people are becoming more aware of, of what we're doing as anglers? I think there's a bit of both. You know, everyone is now being told, you know, global warming and all these things, you know, and we're ruining that. Humans are ruining the environment. We know that. You've got to be mad not to understand that. So if you can do your bit and say, well, at least I'm not polluting the, you know, the fishing lakes or the, 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 the land we're all in. I mean, I've run fisheries. Simon's run fisheries. My son runs the Quay in France. But the, some anglers still leave litter. I mean, I've said to people at the beginning of a week, 24 anglers, you go, no one leaves litter, do they? No, 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 no. And at the end of the week, we're picking litter up because cigarette butts, they're not litter. When people say, chuck it on the floor. People, uh, just it's ingrained in people. They just, they're not as green as they think they are. Line, just discarded in the bushes. People walking with a can, oh, just chuck it in the bushes, it doesn't matter. But it has got better, without a doubt, because you can't turn the television on now without something, you know, being talked about, you know, with green ecology. So yes, that has definitely made a difference. I think people are looking at the brand and saying, well, yeah, there's a few things there. Uh, but I think also people have perhaps become a little bit disillusioned or jaded with the fact that if you take all the major brands, if you took the name away and just look at the product, they're all roughly the same. You know, rig tubing is rig tubing. You know, leads, if you want to talk about leads, they're, they're all the same. They all do the same job. So there's, you know, if you, if you take the banner away and just leave the, the products, you know, it, a rubber bead to rubber bead, a swivel's a swivel. You know, so at the end of the day, when you've got something that's trying to make a difference, a product that's, you know, saying well we can take at least the lead out of the equation you can use a stone and some people are going yeah that's, that's actually not a bad idea and then when they get to use it and realize that actually it might help them catch fish they become more on board and if you can get someone on board with one product that's when they then start looking at the other products and going well yeah, this line's quite good and the hooks are sharp and strong. Oh, yeah, they're quite good. And I quite like this idea of the grips, you know, and bait. Oh, well, now I'm catching quite a few fish on this bait. So it, it's almost like anything. You've got to lure them in with something and then they can sort of like investigate the rest of the products, which in some cases are a little bit different. So, uh, and the ethos, I mean, it's an ethos, the company is trying to do something different uh, and there's a lot of companies out there who really are just doing the same as everyone else is and if they're a big brand they sell product because people like big brands ford sell a lot of cars because ford is ford you know and it it's took you think about all the japanese cars and chinese cars and korean cars you know they're all came in and took a little bit of the market and that's what Palatrat done. They took a little bit of the market, but it's our market's growing. And some of the big brands are losing that share because there's only an infinite amount of carp anglers. You know, if you said there was, say, half a million carp anglers in the UK, tomorrow or next year, there may still be half a million and some, or it could be slightly less. And that share of the market has to be shared out and every new company comes in, takes a bit. That means someone has lost a bit. And Simon's company's, Palatrax as a company is gradually growing. And uh, I think a lot of it's through this team. I think people quite like this, you know, being able to just talk to people and, and say, well, 
Why is the bait better? Why is the line better? Whereas they can't, you can't ring some of the big brands up. You just can't do it. You won't get through to anyone. People ring up and they go, uh, I want to talk about this. And uh, he, they go, uh, he go oh, I'm, I'm Simon. They go, what, Simon Pomeroy? Go, yeah, what, the owner? And they can't believe they're talking to the man who owns the company. And, you know, that makes a big difference to people. They think there's a, you know, a personal touch to it. So, yeah, I think the company's got a good future ahead of it. I wouldn't say if I didn't like the products, I wouldn't use them. I'm not that naive that, you know, I actually don't get a lot out of it. Yes, I get some good deals on things, but if I couldn't get Gamma off of Simon, I'd go to America and buy it because I think it's the best line I've used. I'd pay the import tax on it. And it's it's just one of those things where all my fishing life, I've wanted good products. So I used to make my own bait because I wanted the best bait. You know, I, I like nice fishing rods I, and I spend a lot of money on my fishing rods and reels because I want the best. You know, just because someone offers you a cheap rod or a reel, you know, doesn't mean it's good just because it's cheap. And I don't want it just because it's cheap. I want thing, something that's better than I've got. And if someone came up with a better line, I'd have to say, it's, I'm sorry, mate, but this is definitely better. And I think he'd be the first one to admit it if it was. Yeah, probably uh, upset him, but, you know, I use products that I think make my chances of landing the next personal best, whether it's a perch or whether it's a carp or whether it's a catfish, whatever it is, I don't want to be let down because someone said, oh, have, have this, it's free. Nah, I'm not interested in that. So that's my whole philosophy on fishing tackle, really. Let's move away from fishing tackle then because I've got one more question for you before I let you get back to your own fishing. You run fisheries historically, but you've now seen Simon's place at Ashman's Worthy Pools. What do you think makes his fishery different to ones you've managed in the past or other ones that are available for people to fish? Simon's not in it for the money. Right? So, yes, the fishery has to help fund itself. So, But he can never have more than about five people there because there are only small pools. But the fish that are in there are stunning looking creatures. Not, you know, and they will grow. I mean, I've spent most of my life since the eighties chasing big carp, you know, through Colne Valley and going to France, you know, because I was big, you know, is wonderful. But you get to a point where you go, well, as it happens, it's also nice when you look at a fish and you go, well, look at that. That's a stunning looking thing. And it doesn't matter whether it's 10 pounds. I mean, I was up at Simon's last week and I was float fishing with a match rod, right? Match rod, that's an old fashioned thing, but a float fishing rod. And I caught a 15 pound linear and it was a stunning looking thing. And it was good fun on a float rod. But I was also catching these, pound to three pound. Just, but all of them were beautiful. And you just think, well, I can sit and enjoy this because they're nice looking creatures. You know, I mean, France, right? When I first started going to France, the majority of fish we caught, they all look the same. They had no scales. You know, a few few along the back, they were just like, almost like leathers, but they were big. You know, so, whoa, I mean, I've caught a 60 pound carp, uh, you know, whoopee dee, really. But there's times when, you know, they say you've got to smell the roses along the way. And it's a nice place. It's in the middle of nowhere. You sit there, you're on the side of a valley, and you look out, and all you can see is countryside. And if you hear noise, it's generally just a tractor. <laughs> you know, it's not got busy roads anywhere near it. And the f philosophy that Simon has is to bring those fish on, feed them well. So it is you're told you can only use these products because Simon wants his fish to be healthy. I am absolutely gobsmacked how fisheries allow people to throw anything in there into the water, 
in some cases, which is absolute rubbish, and then wonder why their fish are not healthy. And I can't understand why you would own a fishery where your business is the fish and you don't control how they're fed. You can't go to the zoo and feed the, the animals a jam sandwich. You have to buy their peanuts or whatever it is they're selling to you because they've realised you can't feed these animals weird stuff. So he makes sure the fish are fed properly. Nets and slings and mats are all supplied so you don't bring any chance of bringing disease in is reduced. I mean, obviously, it's hard to control a bird, you know, ducks and various birds fly around and they could land on one lake and land on yours 10 minutes later. Can't do anything about that. And certainly birds do spread diseases. You know, people will say, oh, but they do because they can, because they get wet and whatever. But the reality is Simon's trying to control it so that you get healthy fish. I mean, some of these carp I was catching, they're fat, they're growing, you know, healthy. You look at them, they're nice shape. And you go to some fisheries and the fish are long and thin and you can see they're is it emancipated, emancipated, long, thin, we call them cricket bats where they're all head and there's no depth to them. I mean, one, one of the most important aspects that I think a lot of people don't realise is water quality. And at, at Palatrax and Ashmansworthy Pools, the Simons instigated uh, the diffusers into the water to try and improve the water quality. As I say, you don't throw rubbish food in there. Uh, already the fish that went in uh, 20 pounds, some of them, some of the stock were of a good size, but they're already now fished to over 30 pounds. They're piling the weight on because they're being fed properly and it's a good environment for them. I mean, I've kept fish in tanks and it's the water quality can go bad so quickly if you have, if you give them the wrong type of food, especially if it doesn't get eaten. So the whole ethos is about quality quality fish came from a good stockist uh quality of water if you control the quality of water that's our it's like our oxygen isn't it their water is our oxygen if you go into a smoke filled, i mean you can't go into a smoke filled pub anymore can you but if you go into a smoke filled room you don't want to stay there it's horrible it wouldn't do you any good so if you treat water like our oxygen the better you can keep that water quality the better the fish will be you know they eat more because they're healthy and they grow quicker uh, there's a lot of good facilities there for the people who want to come and fish showers toilets nice little cabin where you can sit and talk to your mate while you're having breakfast uh, swims are nice i mean if we, they've got nice flat swims where you can bivy up i mean in the old days we were quite happy if we had an umbrella <laughs> and a chair to sit on now of course people want comfort when they go fishing you know they don't want to rough rough it like we used to in the old days uh and you've got everything there um and you can drive very close to where you're fishing so you haven't got walk miles i mean i've had to suffer that in the past we walk miles to get to wherever you want to fish but yeah, it's just a lovely little place and being done properly because it's not about pound notes, which a lot of fisheries are, you know. Lovely. Thank you very much for your time and giving us more of an insight into your background with paddle tracks and your background in general. I'm not going to take any more of your time up. So if you want to go get your rod back out and try and get some of these lovely Y barbel or probably chub. Well, it would be nice. I've enjoyed this. I mean, I don't often get a chance to pontificate too much about Palatrax but uh, yeah no it's I, I, it's a journey that I've enjoyed uh, and I shall probably continue to enjoy hopefully but thanks thanks for the time cheers <laughs>